This is the Obscurity to Authority podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. And we're live. Thank you so much, Elliot Halls, for joining us today. Hell yeah. Just getting my camera straight. <laughs> Good stuff, man. I'm excited, man. This I've been following you for a long time. Since I was a kid, I was working. When I started following you, I was still a plumbing apprentice. Um, mm. which was a good job, good pay, um, but definitely didn't last. But I was watching your videos man, every day religiously, and so it's kind of surreal to see you uh, on camera and having a chat. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Good stuff, man. So let's let's talk about some stuff. I want people to know who you are. I don't want to butcher it. Who are you? What's your mission? To make men strong again. That's what I do. It's who I am. I'm a strong man, strength coach. Mm. And I make men strong, bro. Mm. Yeah, we need more of that, man, because, <laughs> yeah. hey, I could use some of that. We're getting on a very, very slippery slope. I don't know if you agree, but I don't know. Things are not heading in the right direction, but we need guys like you bringing this back up. So what what made that your mission? Why did you decide that's the thing you're going to tackle in life? It's what I've been. I was born this mm. way. I'm the oldest of four boys, well, three, three boys and a girl. I was the oldest uh strongest fastest most alpha 10 year old on the <laughs> on the field as a kid i i played football i mean everything masculine i was uh, pro, i was a pro strongman captain of the football team yeah and when i went into my career of course i wanted to make people strong and you know i didn't go looking for men men found me so even when I was like a personal trainer in a fitness gym, I would just look at my role of clients and it was always like 90 percent men. It just it, it's what it's what I've attracted. It's what I am. So it makes perfect sense that now that I'm conscious about it, that I can put that boundary up and say that I make men strong again, not because I chose to, but because that mission has been delivered to me. Wow. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I agree. I think every venture I've seen you come into or get through from your very early content to what you're doing now has in some way, shape or form supported that mission. So where did that start? Because obviously now anyone who knows you, and that's a lot of people know you are the authority. I mean, 2 million plus subscribers across your different YouTube accounts, hundreds of thousands on Instagram. I'm sure countless lives touched. But where did you start? I started uh, as a personal trainer in a fitness gym, and I wanted to be an entrepreneur because my uncle was a personal trainer back in the 1990. I think he became a personal trainer in 1994, and he started training me with a barbell for football. And so the minute he put a barbell in my hands, I knew that this is what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. I knew I was going to teach people to be strong. Uh, like he taught me. And I also knew I was going to work for myself like he did. He was a tremendous uh, influence mm -hmm. on my life. And so uh, when I decided to venture out on my own as a personal trainer, as a freelance, as an entrepreneur, uh, I didn't have a gym, didn't have equipment, didn't have money. So I trained people with trash out of the back of my van in the city parks. And so I called that strength camp. And I started a YouTube channel around the same time so that I can film the workouts and my members could show their friends what cool shit we were doing. I was training men, obviously, at the time, and uh, men and athletes. And so they would show their friends, and that's how I sort of grew my little business, moved into a warehouse, started recognizing that people on YouTube were asking me questions. I, you know, I didn't put it up for a YouTube world. I didn't – I didn't – try to become a YouTuber. I, right. I had no intention of being an influencer. It just wasn't a thing. I started making YouTube videos the minute YouTube came out, basically, and it was just like, oh, okay, cool. These are videos. All right. right. I didn't look at comments. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know right. who's watching. And when I recognized, oh, shit, people are watching, I started answering their questions and engaging with people. And long story short, millions of people have enjoyed my videos. I've got Going on three million subscribers between the two channels. Oh, probably, wow. Yeah, probably more than three million between the two channels. And uh, and here I am. Now, I mean, 
there's been so many parts of the journey, but here I am now, owner of Strength Camp, CEO of Strength Camp International. We have uh, multiple strength camps, nation and worldwide, and I'm very passionate about men's rites of passage and initiation into new life paths for men. So I run uh, almost quarterly, three-day men's retreats where men get together and grow stronger. Wow. Tell me about that. Tell me about those retreats. Well, like I say, it is an initiation, a rites of passage, something our ancestors understood was critical for men in their life path for a boy to go from, you know, and these life path initiations, these times of crisis that require us to die to an old version of ourselves and to be reborn anew happen generally on every every 12 years or so. And, you know, this is true because around the age of 12, a boy goes into puberty and he starts growing hair on his nuts and his testosterone goes up and he needs some he needs some course correcting and some meaning in his life and so our ancestors understood that and what they would do is they would set the boy aside out of society they would offer him challenge they would offer him austerity they would offer him a sense of meaning so that he could, his ego could literally strip down and he can reemerge in the society with a newfound sense of dignity, strength, belonging, and purpose. That no longer really exists in our society. Wonderful thing is that uh, the great majority of my followers are at 24 years old. Hmm. And so it's just interesting. Every, That's my age. Every, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and I just passed my 36-year-old mark, so I'm, wow. I'll be 40. So, like I said, every 12 years, and I find that, you know, a big part of the reason why 24-year-olds are attracted to me is because I'm helping offer some meaning for a time in life that may grow kind of confusing. Hmm. And so, uh, in as my attempt to bring back this critical and sorely needed ritual initiation practice, I went into the study of it because of my own need for initiation, particularly at age 36. I went into a tunnel and uh, and came out with this newfound sense of purpose for helping young men in those stages. Hmm. So tell me about that because I noticed that you were producing videos for quite some time and then it dropped off. What happened there? I went into the tunnel. I What's went into tunnel? this phase where another way to put it is there's a lot of different ways to put it. I like to use the the story of Jonah in the whale in the Bible. Hmm. And uh, so Jonah had a great life. Jonah was – everybody – he was super popular. He was in his city. He had made a lot of money. People loved him. He was really wise. People came to him for advice. He was the man. And at a certain point in his life, uh, God started tapping him on the shoulder and saying, hey, Jonah – I got something else that I need you to do, and I need you to step down for a while. Hmm. And uh, Jonah's like, sorry, God. Uh, <laughs> I got it good right now. Life is amazing. <laughs> what the what the hell do you – what do you mean you want me to step off for a while and, and, and come and follow you or, or do something else? And Jonah just couldn't handle it. He was like, no, no, no. Why would I give this up? And so, you know, God, as he typically does, says, all right, fine. Do whatever you want. So anyway, Jonah ends up, you know, a couple months later, a couple years later, out on a boat somewhere over the ocean. The water always represents the unconscious and the and the emotional body. Hmm. And uh, and he gets into a storm, and the boat flips over, and he falls into the water, and a whale comes and gobbles him up, and he stays in the be in the belly of the whale. You never heard the term belly of the beast. Yeah, yeah. He stays in the belly of this whale. For quite some time. And if you think about in, what's happening in a belly, there is digestion going on. When something's being digested, that means that there are parts that need to be broken off and, and excreted and other parts that need to be assimilated and used for nutrition. Hmm. So it, it, being in the belly, belly of the beast, I call it the tunnel, I call it the belly of the beast, I call it catabasis. There are so many different ways and through hmm. mythology, you know. Uh, but, you know, I, I haven't figured out which one I want to call it. But this I, this mythology within the Old Testament about being in the belly of the beast is about being worked on, 
being alchemized, being transformed. Uh, a lot of it is ego deconstruction and humility. And so ultimately, you know, uh, he's digested down there. God's working on him and he, he ends up spit back out on the shore somewhere and he's a brand new person. He's like, okay, all right, got it. I know what I'm supposed to do. Hmm. I'm going to go do it. I'm totally committed. And he goes back and he, he does works 10 times greater than he could have ever imagined if you, and, and it would have occurred had he not, uh, you know, allowed his ego to get in the way. So my ego's, I, I'm all about ego. My ego's huge. And especially when you, <laughs> when I got three mil, three million subscribers and everybody <laughs> loves me and everywhere I go, I'm like a mini celebrity. Yeah. So when God was asking me, I remember distinctly, he was mm. like that sense in my, in my body and my soul that, all right, Elliot, million subscribers. Now I need you to stop. And I was like, what? No <laughs> way. And so, the physical is a mirror reflection of the metaphysical. And I started to sustain all kinds of injuries. I tore both <laughs> biceps, tore my Achilles tendon, fell on my head and hurt my neck, had an injury, uh, had a, 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 a hernia that needed to be wow. repaired, chipped my tooth. So God was just fucking me up. And so in all that woundedness, what I describe as the tunnel is, has been my healing process. Wow. That, that's interesting. No. So it, is that? Do you think that's what happens when when you come out of alignment? When when you're being told, "Hey, this is what you got to do," but you just won't listen to that inner feeling, that inner voice, and you keep doing what you think you're supposed to be doing, things are just not in alignment, and and the physical will start to break along with the mental. Yeah, it'll all break down, and it'll break down very differently for different people. See, I was a pro strong man. I was a football player. I'm a people know me. I'm known for strength, physical strength. So you know. When God wanted to get to me, I didn't need to end up in a in a, in a whale's belly. Mm. He just started snapping tendons. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds worse. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Interesting. Okay, and you came out of that, and you are now on a new path. You have the clarity. You have the green light from from the big guy upstairs to keep pushing, and you're on, or at least you believe you're on the right track now. Yeah, getting there. Interesting. Interesting. So what's the biggest thing that you've seen men are facing? What's the biggest problem in our society today with men? Because I was going to go through more of your story of becoming a spiritual authority, but now I'm super fascinated, so we'll have to get back to that. What's the biggest problem, the biggest challenge men are facing and why? Men are women. Hmm. And we are being manipulated to be women chemically. So in the foods, the air, you know, the the – the plastics and the pesticides. I recently heard that when women take birth control pills and piss in the pipes, yeah. we drink that water and we take in that estrogen. Uh, and you see our bodies changing. We're carrying more body fat, which mm -hmm. is estrogenic. We've got uh, – and, and we even behave in a very feminine way because we are conditioned by the media mm -hmm. and by the school system to uh, to eschew – and to and to push away from and resent traditional masculinity aggression leadership strength these things uh, are looked at as toxic and so you know between us being chemically changed um, uh, social engineering through this PC culture the brainwashing of, through the media, and then the way the family structure has been destroyed puts us at odds with our fathers and makes us have very un, uh, uh, inappropriate relationships to our mother, which ultimately ends up uh, manifesting itself and reflecting in how we relate to women. Interesting. See, I, I totally agree. I 100% agree. I know even myself, I can feel the impact of a lot of things that you've said. Um, and it's a big part, one society. I mean, the man is evil, right? Yep. Now masculinity is evil. It's I, can, I don't know if it was you who posted or someone posted a picture of a bus sign um, that they were posting. I think it was in the UK that says all men are dot, dot, dot dangerous. And they're saying, right. imagine if, if that was reversed, right? Yep. And we said something like all women are whores or something like that, right? Yep. How... <laughs> Like, um, like, right, making that assumption, as vulgar right. as that is, 
but but they do that and it's accepted and not only is it accepted by society but the government seems to align with it they allow these things like we know um jordan peterson have you heard of him of course yeah so okay. he he's from university of toronto i believe right mm-hmm. so he's from close close to my hometown where i was born uh, and i follow him quite a bit and, and i followed his kind of path of basically that student that she had whatever some non-binary sort of she wanted to be called something they or whatever it was and he wouldn't he wouldn't do it right. and lost his job because he wouldn't do it right. and that's what starts getting scary for me because we, we can fix does it start by fixing the individual because my fear is still well if big government already supports that if they're behind this and the schools are firing people over you know not following the new you know kind of pc agenda and the government is allowing that and the legal system is allowing that how do we fix it is it just starting with the individual well, yes, it does start with the individual and the family. That's key, the individual and the family. But we're starting to see this trickle-down effect with the great white hope, Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump is <laughs> alpha as hope. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's what JLP calls him. That's good. So, uh, yeah, Donald Trump, I, they hate him because yeah. he's alpha as fuck. Right. And so – Everybody who's whining and complaining. Yeah. First of all, all the all of the things they say about him are unsubstantiated. He, mm. they say he's racist and all these kinds yep. of shit, which is is not true. It's not true at all. But these people believe the media, so I wouldn't say the government with the media mm. is totally uh, screwing people, like I said before. True. But to see the American people put a Zeus in office, yeah, uh, says that we're 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 ready for strong masculine alpha leadership once again yeah but see and and that's the weird thing with that on the trump note is one however much like it's it's becoming this is what's blowing my mind it's becoming a bad word or a bad thing to support trump there's kids going to school with make america great again hats that are getting kicked out of school how is that see this is what i'm not understanding how do we how where does that get fixed where does that get realigned because to me it looks like it's so far gone that i start to think about this every day and go are we on a path that we'll never come back from because this is an elected official this is the president of the united states and a kid can't wear a hat with his name on it without get kicking out of school yep. <laughs> like that's that's scary so you're saying we got to fix the individual and fix the family unit and you think there's hope still yes oh yeah We've got – I don't know if we can go much further left. That pendulum has swung mm. as far as I think it can go. When you're questioning the basic building block, the fundamental building block of all life on earth, which is the contrast between masculine and feminine, yeah. you're, really, you're really fucking with nature and you're denying God. And so it, when you go against life, life spelt backwards is evil. And you're going against the, the you're going against life when you start attacking these very simplistic things. Nature is is simple, yeah. but when you go against nature, when you think you're smarter than nature, when you think you could legislate nature, you think you can manipulate nature in people's minds, you're dabbling with pure evil. And so we are living in end times, but mm. end times simply mean that it's midnight. It's as dark as it's going to be, and they say it's going to be you know they say it's darkest right before the sun rises. You know, it, it could it get darker? Yeah, mm. but we're absolutely living in a transition time. Interesting. Yeah, because I I'm seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of this whole. If everybody's right, well, what's wrong anymore? Because now it's becoming this, especially here. We have it, I think, a little bit worse than you guys do in Canada and Toronto, where everyone can be any gender and it's right. Anyone can have any preference and it's right. Um, it's it's becoming this. Even even politically, and any belief that you have that is not some sort of magical unicorn mythical belief is being shut down. It's all nope. Everything's progressive. Everything's what you feel. Everything's what you want it to be. But that's not possible. We know that's not possible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right? So I can't yeah. I can't figure <laughs> out. I mean, I'm believing you when you say there's a light at the end of this tunnel. But what does that look like? What does that look like? What's what's the steps we start taking? What does the family unit have to come back to? What do men have to come back to? What do women have to come back to? Where do we need to be to start seeing this light and getting towards this light? Our true nature. Which is? We don't have to look very far. I'm not interested in trying to recreate the past, Hmm. but something that we need to understand about life. Everything is on a spiral. Our DNA is on spirals. They say the whole universe is spiraling. The, The 
the cosmos are spiraling. Yep. A spiral, if you look at it this way, it's a circle. It means it's going around. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it this way, it's moving upwards. So there's an ascension. So if we want to, if we turn it this way, we're just going to come back to nature. We're going to come back to God. We're going to come back to what's normal and natural. That like these questions that we're having Hmm. about V and they and Z, (laughs) they're (laughs) they're so ridiculous. Yeah, Yeah. But but they were unheard of. 50 years ago, yeah. 150 years ago. Yeah. Think about the George back in the George Washington days. Yeah. I mean, so we are we're going to come full circle where we just come back to what's normal, what's natural, what makes sense, walking mm. the Tao, walking with God, walking with nature. Uh but in in of course in an evolved way. And when I say in an evolved way, I don't mean that uh not the way we're doing it right now. That's right. The, we're dev, we're very devolved. Right. We're at the, we're at the end. We're at the tail end of the darkest, most corrupt and evil ideologies yeah. that have ever been propounded yeah. for this cycle. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the biggest proponents of, of making that a reality is one, at least in Canada, our school systems, because man, the kids that I'm talking to now that are, that are the next generation just coming behind me, that are now just coming out of high school into college university, the things I'm hearing and the way they think, they will not have this conversation with you. This, uh, this will trigger them, so to speak. <laughs> and it's not, it's not what they've seeked. It's what they've been taught. It's what they've been known to be reality. Like one of my younger cousins, she's about five or six years younger than me. And I heard a word for the first time. She posted about how she was so lucky and recognized her pri- privileged for, for being a cisgender individual. And I'm like, what the fuck is cisgender? So I Google, have you heard that before? I don't know what it is, so, but I've heard it. So I Googled it and I'm like, cisgender my cousin's a different gender i google it it just goes an individual whose sexual preference matches their biology and i'm like so a normal person yeah a normal person. but this is the next step in making normal not normal normal can exist we're going to give it a label it's not normal it's a label just like all the other labels which one are you that's dangerous man evil it's evil it's anti-life that doesn't make sense no do you, do you think this is what see my my theory is this is why i love this topic and why i want to talk to you uh my, my theory for whatever that's worth is this is what's causing a lot of unhappiness a lot of misdirection a lot of i think they were saying something like suicide rates uh in our like in the millennial demographic is now or whatever total suicide rates are going up for the first time in the last whatever it's been 30 or 40 years it's been on a decline and they're saying that's going up and up and up and they're saying things like for example transgenders have one of the highest suicide rates out of any part of the populace and i'm wondering if that's because we're coming so far from nature that we think all these changes are what's going to make us happy oh i'm not happy because i'm actually a woman on the inside let me change the outside to match that and then you change it and go shit i'm still not happy now what? And we're boxing ourselves in because we have so much freedom. But the problem is, especially with the youth, and this, this is my thought, and I want to hear your thought, but when you give people infinite options in any direction, they just don't know where to go. Humans need structure. Structure brings freedom. And when you give them yeah. any option, their mind just becomes, I don't know what to do. I'll try this. I'll try this. I'll try that. I'm still not happy. What the hell? Nothing's working. They need a path, right? You're a man. You grow up. You go through this passage. You do this. This is your role. And the same thing for women. But now that's a naughty thing to say. Like to say a woman has a role, you know, forget about it. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, I agree. I agree with you completely. We got to go back to boundaries. Hmm. You know, we, we live in 3D. As much as we like to ideologize, uh, think, dream, come up with shit, all this stuff actually, if you, if you, if you dig deep enough, all were born in universities by people who don't do anything but think. They just think. Right. They're, you know, if you, they, these are people in the uh, in the higher education uh, realm. They they've thought so much that they've let they've they've thought themselves out of any <laughs> sense whatsoever, and so they they're way up living in the clouds. We've got to we've got to come back down to earth and realize that we live in the boundary of flesh. You could, it might sound like a great idea to jump out of a building because we should be free to fly. Right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to jump. I should be free to fly. Yeah. Yeah, but you're going to suffer the consequences. Right. So you know you could be free to kill your unborn baby in the womb, 
but you're going to suffer the consequences. Yeah. There are basic fundamental human laws for living on earth. Right. When you violate those laws, you're going to suffer. You yeah. jump out of a building, you're going to suffer. You cut off your dick and shove it inside <laughs> and take female hormones, you're going to suffer. Agreed. Definitely agreed. I mean, and, and that's the thing. Like, yeah, there is freedom, but there's going to be a consequence. And so, why not guide you in? It's no one. It's just like no one wants the boundary. They don't want to be told what they. They don't want to be told, "Hey, no, don't jump out of a building. You're not allowed." They want to right. know that they can, and then they <laughs> they want to take that path okay. for themselves, right? Which is interesting. Yeah. I mean, and I think that this is the route too, especially for for women. I know we're talking about men, but I see a lot of patterns of unhappiness, of depression, becoming more and more prevalent. I mean, everyone goes through it, but. I see it becoming more and more prevalent even with women. And I wonder if that's because they're they're being put into these roles that they think are right and noble and what they should do as a modern woman and that they should build a career and that they should take high-stress environment and they should be busy all the time doing what a powerful woman does. Um, and they're realizing they're not finding happiness. And I think my girlfriend's a great example, uh, which is she's in a career. It's a great career. It's based on what she, she's an, it's basically an HR manager. So she went to school for HR, got her degree, is in a great company. She's working at a managerial level. She's only turning 24, um, but not very happy, right? And it's nothing to do with the job. It's nothing to do with, with the role. It's That's not her. And I know her well enough going on 10 years soon. She's a nurturer. She is a nurturer. It's a big heart, a lot of emotion, a lot of support, a lot of love. She's not cut for that corporate environment, for that pressure. For She has no interest. She's expressed she has no interest in climbing the ladder. and build, But yet there's a pressure from society that if she doesn't do that, Oh, like you're just a stay-at-home mom, right? You don't you don't have a career of your own. You need a career. Like her family will say it. Everyone will say it. you need a career. You need a mission. Oh, you can't just stay home. You can't just support your husband. You need to have your own thing. And it's like, well, if you have your thing, and that's fine. If there's a woman out there that really wants that and that's their vision, do it. But sure. if you have your thing and I have my thing, now we both come home stressed. Now there's kids that are being raised by the babysitter. Now they're not getting our attention because we're both burnt out. We're not giving each other attention because we're both burnt out. Instead of supporting on a mission like we used to. You know, where the man would go out and do his thing, like if you watch Mad Men in the advertising world, he'll go out and build the agency and, and close the clients and make the money. And he comes home and there's someone watching the kids and there's someone supporting the family, which is possibly even a harder job than going to work to begin with. <laughs> like, I respect that. There's no disrespect at all. It's a tough job. I don't know why it can't be respected, but, you know, he, they come home and that's there and there's a balance. Now we've shattered that. We're both bread earners. We're both stressed. We're both busy. And it seems like, now, like you have to push at it because women decide to stay home. I'm going to be a stay-at-home mom. It's looked at in a bad way. So, wh what do you think about that role of women in the in the household? That's where they belong. That's where they'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing: they don't pay taxes. Yeah. And if you want to know why this big push for women in the workplace and for women to be like men, it's because now they're taxpayers. They're tax slaves. So there's more consumers, right. more consuming. And more tax, paying more taxes. Right. My my wife, she has a higher uh, education, a higher degree than me, and she will tell you, and I will tell you, that the happiest she's been is barefoot and pregnant. Wow. Like she, like that's that's the most magical thing yeah. that a human being can do on the planet, is to create and to care for and to nurture. And to raise yeah. another human being. Yeah. That is far more important than working in an office or, or competing with men in the high rises. All that stuff, men do that because we can't compete with women. It really should right. be, it is the other way around. In fact, uh, my brother went through a Native American rites of passage when he was in, in high school and college. And, uh, and a part of his rites of passage was to, was to, be able to uh, live up to the power of the woman by shedding blood because a woman sheds blood every month. Hmm. So part of his initiation process was to shed blood because as a man, we just can't do that. So he had to, you know, had to honor that aspect of himself by shedding blood. So nature offers women brilliant, Im magical, amazing gifts and then birth control pills. Right. And go to the, and then go to the marketplace. And then their womb is all polluted. They've been fucking 15, 20, 50 guys <laughs> before they get pregnant. 150? I don't know. <laughs> so they're, they're completely ravaged. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and their hormones are all screwed up. Yeah. And, you know, at that point, 
at that point, a woman is very used up. Yeah. And I don't advocate uh, promiscuity for men either. Right. I mean, we could get into that. I don't. Yeah. I don't promote it for either partner. Yeah. But we're talking about why women are miserable. Yeah. And uh, and then so when they get to the point where they're all used up, they've been on pills, uh, and now they want to have a baby, they got to go and and get all kinds of shots and go to the doctor and and get their eggs put on petri dishes and uh, yeah. injected with with, uh, with 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 sperm and stuff. So it, I mentioned it in a previous podcast that we're, we we got to the point where we're manipulating nature to a dark degree, and it's all dark science. And it begins with the a lot of it, a lot of our social ills begin with the manipulation of the woman, the manipulation of the woman, uh, which is uh, which is allowed because men have been emasculated and removed from the home. Hitler said it even. He said that if the best way to control a society is to remove the male from the home, yeah. remove the father from the home and make the women and children dependent on the state. That's what we have. Hmm. The state is big daddy. And, and, and husband telling this, telling women and children what they need to do. And the fathers are out of the home. They're in prison or they're, uh, you know, easy divorce makes it, makes it simple for them to. And then also we've got welfare state right. where, you know, the government will give women money not to have a husband, but to have lots of babies. Wow. So, I mean, we're there. It's, we're at that time. It's That's dark. very true. I've actually never thought of that that way. That's true. You think you think of all the men that you know are in prison and all the single moms raising kids that are dependent on a welfare check, that are are dependent on social housing programs. They really wow. That's that's interesting. And it's funny enough, I've I've been able to spot a lot of evil in the world based on things that Hitler used to teach. Like for example, uh, they used to put fluoride in the water supply of concentration camps, right? Because it would it would dull the mind. And well, what do we put in our water supply since? Whenever how I don't know how how long we've been doing that the forties fifties because they yeah. said that teeth were rotting well why are we still doing it <laughs> we learned that shit from Hitler you don't yeah. know that after after the world wars we took all his top leaders and scientists brought them here yeah. I was like okay how are you manipulating those people yeah and so we're using the same tactics see people got to wake up to this so let's go back to that topic though on on the women and then the men's side and I just want to be clear for people to make sure there's no like you're not just some angry guy here talking down to women you have an amazing wife and you have daughters as well right yeah I have three daughters three daughters there you go three daughters beautiful wife so you're you're well vested in their their success in their outcome you're not trying to suppress women by any means right? <laughs> no right. no I'm trying to restore women to their wonderful power yeah yeah of course I got to do it with men first because that's where I'm at but I would love to see women restored to their to their natural, intuitive, life giving powers. Mm. That's that's their gift. Mm. Well, maybe if men were men, women could be women again. So maybe uh, it does start there. It does start with <laughs> men, and I agree with you. Yes, interesting. That's so, why you know I I don't complain about women. I'm just describing right. the state of things. But that's why I work with men. That's why we do right. initiation. That's why I do the work that I. Yeah, yeah, and to make it happen, right? And that's why. Way. And that's why I wanted to be clear on that because some people, you know, people put up this resistance wall, like, oh, he just hates women. He just wants to. He's not trying to press <laughs> anybody. Like, you're here for everyone's <laughs> best interest because there's genuine problems. Um, and yeah. so let's talk about men because you you mentioned like this is all the stuff we feel about women. So let, let's play it equally. What's wrong with men that we have to fix? Like you mentioned about promiscuity with men. Why is that a problem? Well. Promiscuity in men is a problem because it is all about our addiction to the sensual, which is a very, it's very anti-masculine to be addicted to the sensual. That's very feminine. And mm. we're addicted to the sensual in a very pathological way because it's emotional. And a lot of that addiction comes from not having our needs met by our mommy or having an inappropriate attachment to our mommy. So we look for it in other women. So, you know, I've said in some of my videos that, you know, you we're out there, you know, our, our mommies didn't give us their breast and we're out there looking for it to suck on other women. And so uh, when we become addicted to sex, addicted to women, addicted to sensuality, we lose all sense of groundedness and direction and stoicism and we can't lead. The reason why Women are really leading us right now. Women are the leaders right now in a myriad different, different ways. But the promiscuous culture has allowed it to be that way because we become pussy addicted. We put the pussy on the pedestal. And then like if uh, if my wife or my girlfriend doesn't like something, 
ooh, I better walk the line, otherwise I might not get any pussy. Well, <laughs> we gotta, we, we have to not be yeah. so needy yeah. for the vagina so that we can learn to love with our, we gotta learn to love consciously. Real masculine love is not an emotional love. And it's not a physical love. And a physical love is an emotional love. So the addiction to busting nuts and coat and being cozy in that mm. way. When we can detach sex from love and know consciously that I love this woman and I don't need her sex and I still love her, that's masculine love. That's how we learn to love and teach loving to our partners, to our wives. See, that's something I think a lot of men have never thought about, right? That's a whole different approach, right? It's sex has been the thing. That's the thing that makes you masculine. The more, the better. No, right? it makes you feminine. It's corrupted mm. us. Interesting. It's corrupted both sexes. Interesting. So what, what else, what else are men? I mean, cause we ranted on women for a while, so I gotta be fair. What else are the big kind of problems with men right now? Why are men not men besides that? Well, like I said, over attachment to an, an, a, an a inappropriate relationship to our mothers. Mm. There was a time <clears throat> our ancestors understood that when a boy was becoming a man, that he needed to there, cross culturally throughout all cultures. There were rites of passage initiation, and there were there were always two elements, regardless of how they went about it. There was always two elements, and uh, Robert Bly talks about this in Iron John, and it is a movement away from the world of the mother a removement from the from the world of the mother and an atonement to the world of the father a moving away from the sensual world from the world of matter from the world of society from the world of sensation from the world of being coddled and cozy and <clears throat> that is a that is a physical and a metaphysical thing so what the older wiser elder men and the women understood was that when this boy was approaching that age where he needed to be, he, he needed to learn what it is to be a man by having his ego deconstructed and get off a of mommy's tit, they would strip him away from the society. They would take him away. And then it would often be a, a, lar a big enactment where they would, they would bust into the hut with masks on and they'd, rawr, they'd scare him because he's, you know, he's starting to feel his oats. So he's got to be humbled. And so, you know, the, the women would play along also too. Oh, don't take my boy. And they would, they would strip him and they, they'd take him away into the woods somewhere, set him apart. It was very important. And then mm. he'd be set apart from society for a time. That's why I think this whole idea of men going their own way has a lot of merit to it. Mm. You, you need to go their own way. And there was always a process of deconstruction, which came in the form of austerity challenge and then a reintegration through meaning and a atonement with the father the fathers and the great father above and so i like to r remind people of um you know the movie uh the lion king when uh simba his dad dies and he ends up in the jungle and you know that's symbolic of being lost in the wilderness and the old the old initiator, Rafiki, the old monkey, mm. finds him and takes him up onto the mountain. This is about the meaning. Takes him up onto the mountain and points to the sky. And this is why men always had religion. Religion is very important for masculinity. And I think that's a part of what our reconstruction is going. It is. Chris, religion's coming back. Um, right. And so they would take him up to the mountain. <laughs> he took him up to the mountain and pointed to the, to the heavens and said, look. You have a responsibility as a man to go back and lead, not just for you, not just for your tribe, but for your father and your grandfather and their great, great grandfathers. And, you know, you began to see that lineage. And so that offered him a sense of meaning, a sense of dignity, a sense of right belonging and, uh, and, and purpose for him to go back into, you know, so it's, it's all rites of passage, the whole movie. He goes back into society and now wow. he's ready to tackle the dark forces and to lead. That's crazy. See, we watch this stuff and it never sinks in. There's messages, nope. there's messages and we're just not, we're not receiving them. See, that, that's a great message. I think that that's something that's lost. Men don't have, you're right. Men don't have any form of rite of passage. There is no more struggle. Even in my, even in my own small way, I attribute a lot of the, 
success that I've had now, how little it is, but I've attributed a lot to all the difficulties and struggles and those moments I've had to go through, whether it was facing death from people very close to me very early on multiple times, or it was the first, like the first job I had, which was plumbing. It wasn't the nice kind. It was the outside industrial kind and, and having falls and, and not being able to walk for six months and uh, working in housing projects with people with meth and bathtubs and guns, like the crazy shit that I went through when I was really young, I was only 16, 17, and I worked in a world that was a lot harder than the average job people are getting now. I attribute that to my mindset, my growth, my development. I think that men just, you know, they don't have, definitely they don't have any formal rites of passage, maybe a couple if you're religious, um, but they also just lack struggle. I feel like everything's become so easy and everyone's there with the handout, even in society. If you can't make it, you can't make money, here's a check. You can't buy a house, here's a house. This is what you do next, go to school. And I have friends who are going to school now, for example, for six, seven, eight, nine years because they're doing entire degree programs to get to the end. I'm not ready for work yet. I'm going to go back to school. My parents are going to pay for it. And they'll go yeah. another four years. They just don't want to face the reality. And then they come out of that. And what kind of person are they? Eight years of avoiding any difficulty. So yeah, it's, I, it's, we need that. That's that attachment to – it's the feminization of men. All of this attachment to coziness and yeah. comfort. And so one of the things that is critical for men and for rites of passage are is austerity, I mentioned before, challenges. Mm. And so, you know, for example, fasting. You know, yeah. every every rite of passage and every religion has periods of fasting. Fasting it breaks you down, humbles you. So we live in this culture that's overconsumption, consuming is feminine, mm. constantly consuming in. Think about the nature of the vagina. Taking in, taking in. We're always taking yeah. in. We're taking in information. We're taking yeah. in food. We're taking in. We're consuming, 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 consuming. Right. Uh, fasting is about abstinence. And so we stop consuming. And the opposite of consuming then is producing. And there's a producing power to fasting, to stopping, to abstinence of eating food. <laughs> the body actually begins to grow anabolic. Uh, there's, you know, autophagy happens. So then the cells are being broken down and there's a regrowth stem cells. So you literally are breaking down and being built back up. It's almost like a death and rebirth process biochemically and physiologically through the abstinence of eating. So I know that and I apply that and I practice that fasting is <laughs> probably one of the most important things men can do to reclaim their masculinity. Interesting. So that that's my biggest weakness right now. If, if I could have any, it's the consumption specifically around food. Uh, I lost about 20 pounds in the last three months, still nowhere near close enough. Um, and it's, it's been a constant battle with food. And I don't know what that is or what the deal is and why it's so damn hard, <laughs> but it's, it's a weakness I recognize I shouldn't have. And so I'm curious on your thoughts on weight loss and health and fitness. You mentioned fasting and you practice fasting. What kind of fasting do you practice? Is there intermittent fasting? There's, there's these long periods. What do you do? So you mentioned intermittent fasting. That's, that's good for a lifestyle. But most of us, like yourself included, need a prolonged fast. Mm. You, need to, you need to cut out food for 10, 20, 40 days. Wow. <laughs> because it's, it's going to break you down. It's yeah. going to break you down. And it's going to break the addiction. You know, the addiction to sex is just like the addiction to food. It's just like the addiction to money and to cars and to clothes and all the shit that makes us soft that the world tells us makes us cool, mm. really makes us soft. And so the most insidious form of that consumptive addiction is food. Right. And so if you want to reclaim your life, you've got to break that addiction with a prolonged fast that not only will, of course, break that addiction, but will break you down and build you back up physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. Right. And that's why all the great masters did fasting. So if you want to write a passage for yourself, hmm. put yourself under the stress of a prolonged fast. Yeah, Lose all that weight instantly. You can do a prolonged fast. You say you lost 20 pounds. It may have taken you months. You lose 20 pounds in a week. Yeah, but will that come back? <laughs> well, that's why I said you need to make it a lifestyle. You break, the, you break it so that you can learn to live God. new again. You gotta be, it's a born again process. You die yeah. so that you can be born again. If you go back to eating all the, you know, the cozy comfort foods and shit right. after your, 
after that prolonged fast and you don't continue to fast. The key is you then – see, people people like to start with intermittent fasting. Mm. That's not the – you don't start there. Mm. That's, that's, the, that's the lifestyle. You start with – especially if you're carrying too much body fat and, and no man should be carrying more body fat than is necessary for right. him. Uh, you start with a prolonged fast. Interesting. Yeah, because see, I think a lot of people address the symptom. Like if I'm talking intermittent fasting, that might be a slow weight loss tool, but that's not addressing the mental issue behind why the weight's there to begin with or the overconsumption. Right. So when you're saying for me, okay, so if I do – and I, I have a taste of what you're talking about in terms of that reset because one thing that I did do was uh, I work with a naturopath who works with a bunch of UFC fighters here in Toronto, and he put me on this – this he determined out of fatty liver. He did some blood work, whatever. Uh, he put me on this this cleanse, which is – pretty stripped down there's no sugar every if there, there's beef it's grass-fed beef there's no dairy there's no uh, artificial carbohydrates no breads um and that was only two weeks and that was like the hardest two weeks i think i've gone through food wise the cravings the headaches the just like shitty feeling for a week at a time and i noticed when i came out of that cleanse even just that my look to food was different i didn't have the same like right now i don't have the same crazy craving for every like i was just loading up go to mcdonald's until you can't eat salt anymore and then wash it down with the mcflurry because you had so much salt you want something sweet and then go back to something like i was just going ridiculous circles and i've lost that just from the cleanse so i i think that's a taste of what you're mentioning like i wonder if i did do a full fast for a period of time if that would be even stronger and and what would you recommend in terms of length of time for someone doing it for the first time well, the very first thing I would tell you is that it, it's easier to fast than to do those cleanses. Interesting. Because when you do those cleanses, you're still consuming. Mm. And when you consume, you're in the psychological state of consuming. And you also are spiking consumption hormones like insulin and mTOR. You want to cut those out. You want to chop those down. You want to go into a state of autophagy and breakdown. And when you're when you go into that state of breakdown – you lose the hunger because your insulin is low. Right. You won't be hungry. First, you see, you said you did it for two weeks and yeah. it may have been a challenging two weeks. Your first two days will be tough. By day three, you'll be like, oh, shit, I don't even want to eat. Really? Yeah, you got to rip the Band-Aid off quickly. And there's no you negative the health? Like there's no – that's not going to screw anything up? Not only is there no negative, but it gives you superpowers. Interesting. So you would still – see, this is my concern. I'm like, if I do that, you got to put me in an island somewhere away from everybody <laughs> and let me do it. But you're saying I can do this while I work. Well, this is why men were set aside. It's a good mm. idea to set ourselves aside, and that's why I do grounding camps. And so at grounding camp, uh, this one coming up, uh, we're going to be implementing some fasting. And then uh, I just decided later on this year we're going to do a prolonged fasting uh uh, immersion grounding camp where we're going to fast for five days. I'm gonna, we're, hmm. I'll prepare everybody with uh, uh, several days of fasting leading up to it and then strict water fasting for the five days that we're together. So it's good to set yourself apart, but if you can't, well, then you, you know, you just, you nut up and do it. Interesting. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to just kind of disappear for a week and do this. It would be great, you know, go be in nature. Hmm. Interesting. I got to check out that. I actually saw that grounding camp. I got to do that. And I noticed too, you offer coaching one on one. And I thought that was very unique if you still do it because I read through your website and you mentioned how traditional coaching one on one with people has not really been the most effective thing, sitting down and giving them these tactics and these strategies. And what you prefer is going on a walk, grabbing lunch, spending a couple hours. Is that something you still do? Yeah, I still do that. Uh, but I'm developing a new coaching program mm -hmm. right now. And so, uh, and it all centers around fasting. Because I've realized hmm. that it is a big part of my mission and a big part of the process that's going to allow men to be great again. And also something that requires a lot of support and a lot of help. So uh, I, I put out an application and I brought a few people on as a test period. I'll be putting out an application again very soon here. And so I'll be working with people in a group and one-on-one -on -one online to get through these prolonged fasts for fat, rapid fat loss and life transformation does someone have to be because i'm thinking myself like even just hearing that it's, it's intimidating like shit i'm not ready i'll do it later does someone have to be mentally ready for that or is it something that they should just jump into regardless well let me ask you a question when i told you about the young man the boy who uh it was time for him to be initiated hmm. he he wasn't ready <laughs> you're never ready when jonah was asked to do the right thing he wasn't ready you see what I'm saying? You're never ready. So 
you can choose to prolong that readiness, but eventually that whale is going to come and swallow you. Mm. And so it looks like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, depression, anxiety, life breakdown. All these things are basically, oh, you're not ready? Well, the boogeyman is coming to get you. The whale is coming to swallow you. Right. That's a good point, man. So I got I got to do that. I'm going to look into this and see how uh, maybe I'll message you and get some more uh, advice on how to go about this. I'd like to do a grounding cap at some point. Obviously, event schedules loaded this year, but at some point I will do that and save one of those coaching dates for me. I still want to do the one-on-one lunch thing because I'm in Florida quite a bit. I'd love cool. to just sit with you and explore this because I think there's a lot of things that I myself could definitely have solved that you have a lot of value. And you've always been a mentor to me, even if you didn't know it. And that's why I'm bringing you on this podcast and I'd like to continue uh, that relationship. So I'll leave it at that. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you? Uh, well, YouTube. Just mm. Google. I have two YouTube channels, Strength Camp and Elliot, uh, Elliot Hulse. I will begin regular uploading once again pretty here, pretty soon here now that I'm out of the tunnel. Yep. And so I have that on the plan. And then uh, I'm usually pretty active on Instagram. So at Elliot Hulse on Instagram. And if they want to get into your programs or coaching or product books, anything, where can they find that? ElliotHulse.com. You'll see links there for grounding camp, something every man needs to do. Also, too, mm-hmm. you'll learn about Strength Camp, which is my uh, which is my company that trains trains people physically. You know, I, I'm still a strength coach, and so if you're a strength coach and you're wanting to even open your own gym, we have a program that helps you do that. Very cool. I got to come down one day and hang out with you guys and, and see all this in person at some point. Yeah, man. Awesome. Thanks so much, brother. I appreciate the time. You got it. Awesome. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.